Nicole Schreiner, and I'm here to talk about developing flavor and spirits with you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or uh, wait till the end. It's kind of hard to see uh, when questions pop up as I'm talking on the screen. So uh, I will leave some time at the end if um, anyone has any questions. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nicole. I, um, there you go. I studied chemical engineering here at Michigan State. Uh, I did my bachelor's and PhD here. Um, I did my thesis in um, con distilled spirits production, uh, saving energy. Because that's a whole nother conversation if you have any questions about that. I also pursued a master Bluer diploma at Siebel and Domans in Germany and Chicago. Uh, I've collectively worked uh, as a distiller and brewer for about 10 years. I am also the fermented beverage minor instructor here at Michigan State. We have a minor that focuses on winemaking, brewing, and distilling. I also manage our fermented beverage analysis lab and research lab. I have one grad student working on a couple different projects right now. And I also own a consulting company called Effervescent Solutions, LLC. So to focus on what we're talking about today, where does flavor come from? And the short answer is everywhere. Uh, we're going to talk about all the details in uh, creating a spirit and where those uh, changes could be made to change the eventual flavor or aroma of the spirit. So if we focus at, if we look at raw materials, we have the grain bill, obviously, um, depending on what type of product you're making, whether that's a gin, uh, vodka, or any type of whiskey, you're going to be looking at different raw materials. Something that's a little bit less uh, focused right now is the variety of the grain. So not, not all corn is created equal. We'll talk about that a little bit, as well as actually where the grain was grown. That's a lot less uh, researched and published. But if you think about the example of winemaking, um, a Cabernet that's in California does not grow like a Cabernet that's in Washington or in Michigan, and there's reasons for that. Uh, if we take the next step into mashing, mashing equipment can affect your flavor as well as what enzymes and your mashing profile. And the next step would be fermentation, your yeast type, uh, the temperature of pitching rate on versus off grain. There's a lot of parameters in fermentation that I believe are a little overlooked. Uh, there should be an article coming out um, in the winter uh, magazine that has uh, all talking about fermentation. So I'm just gonna touch on a few of the important things in that today. And then distillation, not just uh, continuous versus a batch column, but the type of still, the technique of distillation, even the shape of the helmet of the still can all affect the flavor. And then, Aging, obviously, how long you're going to age it for, what type of char level, what type of wood type, the temperature and the humidity of your aging cellar. And then finally, filtration. Uh, filtering uh, the large pieces out could be very different from uh, going through a sterile filter. So we'll talk briefly about that too. So raw materials and the grain bill. Uh, everyone who is in here is probably a distiller or is somewhat into the distilling industry. And you know that there's a variety of raw materials you can use. And, you know, bourbon, for example, has to be 51% corn, but then you're kind of open of what you want to use in the rest. Usually it's rye and malt, but there's plenty of bourbons that have a little oat or wheat as well. So in looking at um, the different percentages of those can vastly affect the final flavor. And then thinking about if you look in the brewing industry, they have a lot of different specialty malts that they use, uh, different caramelized malts, different um, roasted malts that could be used in the whiskey industry uh, to get some of that flavor out. Yes, some of it will not make it through into the distillate, but some of it will as well. And traditional corn. So you have 100% corn whiskey from a yellow dent number two. Well, that's going to be a pretty typically sweet uh, corn flavored mash. Uh, rye is known for its spicy character. Even up to just 5% of throwing rye into a mash bill can really drastically affect the flavor. And then again, specialty malts, throwing a little bit of oat or wheat uh, can really change the mouthfeel and the overall flavor of the whiskey. Oops. 
So looking at grain variety a little bit, this is what my research lab is focused on right now. Um, if we talk about corn for a second, yellow den is by far most popular um, corn that's grown, hybrid that grows really well, its yields are great. Farmers like to grow it because they're going to get a lot. Distillers typically like to buy it because they're going to get a high yield. There's a lot of starch. But uh, there's a little bit more popularity right now looking at heirloom grains uh, and specifically heirloom corn varieties. You might have heard of Bloody Butcher, uh, Jimmy Red, Snyder Multicolored are ones that we can grow in Michigan, but there's plenty of ones throughout the country uh, that are also grown. And we're at the first stage of looking at these corn trials, essentially. We're growing 20 different varieties of corns throughout Michigan, even in different locations, and seeing how their final flavor is. And I'll be the first one to tell you, they taste dramatically different. Um, Wapsie Valley ha happens to be my favorite one. I mean, honestly, when I tasted it, I thought that I would not be surprised if this was an aged whiskey that was redistilled. So it, was, it just had these really complex uh, flavor and aroma notes that it was very different from yellow dent. So we're also doing that with rye. And I want to shout out um, some of the researchers at Michigan State and uh, Mammoth Distilling. They have resurrected a old variety of uh, rye called Rosen. It used to be grown heavily throughout Michigan uh, and on South Manitou Island, which is a very small island in northern Michigan. And they have recultivated and started growing it. And so we're going to be making a small amount of whiskey with that. and. Eventually, it could be one of the more popular rye varieties out there. So the next step is um, mashing. So what variables are there in mashing? Well, the actually, the mashing vessel itself, right? So if you have a really robust mashing vessel with a mixer with uniform heating, you're probably going to get a uh, homogenous solution. But if you don't have um, an impeller or your burner is on one side or you you know you might have a pocket somewhere in your mash tun you might not not necessarily get a lot of mixing and you're going to have uh, a degree of sacrification so the first step of mashing is gelatinization that's when water gets into that starch and starts swelling it when it swells it it's allowed to break and it exposes the starch then we have liquefaction which helps reduce the viscosity and as you can see these little blue circles uh, basically represent glucose, so sugars, but they're in a uh, polymeric form, meaning they're all connected to each other. So as this gets processed, the um, sugars end up breaking into smaller chunks. We call that dextrin. And then even smaller chunks is when we get into these fermentable sugars. So in sacrification by beta amylase, uh, we, we convert these some of these chains into two chains of um, sugar called maltose. Now, the time and the temperature of how this all happens, you could be spending a lot of time in the liquefaction stage. You could be spending a lot of time in the sacrification stage. And when we talk about enzymes, we'll talk about uh, how long you're spending in these optimal enzymes can eventually change your sugar profile. And that sugar profile is going to make the yeast uh, react in different ways. So I read something online the other day that said mashing is for um, yield. And that's true. Um, you want to get as much glucose as possible and as much potential alcohol. But what's overlooked there is the types of sugars that are actually going into the yeast and producing flavors can dictate your um, flavor profile. So it, it will change. It's not as predictable, but it can um, affect your final fermentation product. I also want to talk about phenolic acid release really quick, and we're going to talk about what phenolic acids are and why they're important. But this happens in the mashing stage. So you have decisions to make in your mashing at what temperature and what time and what enzymes you're going to use. And the main goal, yes, should be getting all the sugar out, but you also could be thinking about what type of flavors you're going for. Phenolic acids are bound to the cell wall similar to how starch is kind of bound in, in the um, granule. So if we don't release any phenolic acid, it cannot then go on and become a flavor compound. We'll talk about what that could be in a little bit. So 
enzymes, we touched on this for a second, but there's four-ish uh, starch-specific enzymes. You've probably heard of other ones when we talk about mashing because those are directed like uh, beta, beta glucanase is directed towards breaking down beta glucans. Uh, and that's not specifically for starch, but for starch, we the famous ones are beta, beta amylase and alpha amylase. And they do different things. They're both important, but they do different things. So if you take a look at this table, you can see that they have uh, different optimum temperatures, different optimum pHs different optimum or in inactivation temperatures, but they're both working on the starch. So in brewing, uh, when you're only doing one rest, you're picking something in between these two temperatures to try and optimize getting both of these uh, enzymes. In brewing or in distilling, you usually buy uh, bulk enzymes that might have a mixture of multiple things and the manufacturer generally gives you an optimum pH and a temperature range that they work. If you change that temperature range or that temperature that you want to hold at, the enzyme is going to act differently, especially if it's a mixture. You might be optimizing one versus another, and you're going to end up with different products. Over here, it shows that beta amylase, uh, the, a great way to remember this is beta takes bites. So it's usually what you want active at the end. Uh, it makes maltose, so it takes bites of starch ends and creates maltose, that two-chain sugar. Uh, alpha amylase uh, just works on the inside of that starch molecule and breaks into more dextrins. Limit dext dextrinase is another popular one. Uh, they break at the alpha 1,6 bonds, which is just um, basically a branch part. They're able to get into those kind of nicks and crannies of the starch and be able to break those down. And there's not as many of those, but it's still important. Maltase uh, can be found in some uh, malted barley. So if that's uh, present or you're using a maltase enzyme or it's in your enzyme mixture, you can expect a lot of glucose. And that can be a good thing or that can be not what you're going for. It kind of depends. Um, in general, distiller's malt is made to have really high DP power and that's diastatic power essentially has a lot of alpha and beta amylase in in the malt but you can if you are aiming to you know get more fermentable sugars or get more simple sugars like glucose uh, you might think about using different types of enzymes and that's a great conversation to have uh, with your enzyme manufacturer or I'd be happy to um, sit and talk with you about it too so back to phenolic acids really quick now that we know that they are released in mashing um, I've listed a few and they look like, you know, foreign things right now, but you might uh, recognize vanillic acid, uh, which does smell and taste like vanilla, but can also be um, transferred into uh, vanillin, which is vanilla. You also have caffeic acid, uh, syringic acid, P. cumaric, and ferulic acid is something that also is a popular out there. For a long time, German brewers have known, and I learned this in brewing school in Germany, is that ferulic acid can be uh, chemically changed to 4-VG in fermentation, which is a spicy and clove character. And this is typically um, an apparent in German Hefeweizen beers. So they've known for a long time that they do this ferulic acid esterase rest at 37. Ferulic acid esterase is an enzyme which helps release those phenolic acids from the plant wall. So to recap, in the mash, instead of starting at 40, 50, 60 degrees Celsius, they actually start a lot lower at 37. And what that does is it activates a specific enzyme that then allows the phenolic acid to be released into the mash. And then uh, because we have more ferulic acid, we eventually should have more 4-VG. And unfortunately, this is also dependent on the yeast strain and other variables. But without this uh, rest, you cannot expect to get all uh, of that character. Uh, and so looking back at the bigger picture of phenolic, phenolic acids, the uh, amount and type of phenolic acids in these grains are actually dependent on the grain variety and the amount of stress. They're actually developed via a reaction to stress. So one thing that my lab is working on is looking at the phenolic acid kind of profile of these different uh, heirloom and different types of varieties of grains to see if we can kind of pinpoint 
you know, this one has a lot of this phenolic acid, and then it has this a lot of sensory um, component. So I'm kind of trying to look at the raw material and be able to make conclusions about the final distillate. Uh, because as you can see, there's so many variables in between that can affect the flavor. Uh, we're trying to just draw conclusions like that. So on to fermentation. Uh, this is a depiction. You'll see something similar in the uh, fermentation um, article that will be out soon, but it does a really good uh, description of kind of what a yeast cell does. And if you imagine in this white box, Think of it as a black box. There are so many different pathways that can happen and that do happen. And yes, because we're in an acidic environment and oh, there's less oxygen, we're going to promote uh, making alcohols. But all of these other pathways and compounds are possible to be created. Yeast have the ability to not only take in just carbohydrates, but also amino acids and fatty acids. Then go through a series of various different pathways and uh, spit out phenols, sulfur compounds, aldehydes, esters, glycerol, um, organic and fatty acids as well, and then obviously alcohols and higher alcohols. Uh, if they are in, not in a healthy state, they're going to make autolytic compounds, and generally those are unwanted. But if you just take a look at how many different compounds that can be created, you can understand that whatever goes into the fermentation uh, can really affect you know, the final flavor. Now these compounds are made on very small concentrations, so they're a little bit difficult to um, quantify and know, but there are some rules uh, of governing of what when you can make more or less of something, and we're gonna touch on those in a second. So what do these formation of flavor and aroma de compounds depend on? Well, obviously yeast type. Um, you could have the same exact mash and use a different yeast strain and get a completely different product. There's a reason why there's brandy and wine yeast and you don't use them necessarily for whiskey. Although I think that would be a great idea because you have a lot of uh, things going on there. But uh, beer yeast for whiskey yeast is a, is a very possible thing too. So, but they all make slightly different um, flavor and aroma compounds. And so it's going to vastly change your product. Another variable that you could manipulate with is pitching rate. In general, uh, less yeast are going to produce more fusel alcohols and esters. And I've actually read a couple of papers. Some of them are contradictory to each other. So I think more research needs to be done in these areas, specifically uh, for spirits or just done by certain types of yeast, because it's very possible that different types of yeast react differently. So these are not hard and fast rules. They're just in general what's accepted out in literature, but again, could be either way. Temperature in general is going to increase fusel oils or fusel alcohols and esters. So fusel alcohols are known as higher alcohols and they add to aging potential. So they're, my thought is that if you ferment a little bit hotter than normal in your whiskey, then you could have potentially more tails, but also more uh, compounds that are for uh, aging potential. You wouldn't want to do this in a vodka, right? Vodkas, you want to be very neutral, essentially just ethanol. So in that case, you wouldn't want to try and exercise um, these kind of rules. You want to stick to as clean as possible. So don't forget to think about what you're actually making and what you're going for. Other factors uh, include, but are definitely not limited to, uh, head pressure on yeast. So head pressure is the amount of basically pressure that the yeast feel if, if you, they were to talk about their feelings. Um, that also relates to how much CO2 is dissolved in solution. Um, also oxygen, if you are, um, you know, oxygen is a little more talked about in the brewing industry, uh, probably because the, the spirits are going to be distilled and People don't think like it's a it's a big deal. Like as long as the fermentation completes and we get a lot of alcohol, we'll be fine. But oxygen promotes yeast health, and so more oxygen, more growing yeast, and potentially a faster fermentation, but potentially also changing the flavor. And then most people have probably heard of sour mashes. So if you are pitching with another uh, bacteria, uh, like a sour uh, lactic acid bacteria. 
or another souring bacteria, you are uh, taking away nutrients from the yeast. So you can expect less alcohol, but obviously more types of organic acids, and those are potentially good for aging. And then the last nutrient is free amino nitrogen. Free amino nitrogen is very overlooked. Uh, larger breweries play around with this, but even down to the type of uh, amino acids that are fed to the yeast can change the direction of their pathways and potentially promote or unpromote certain flavor and aroma compounds. And then on versus off grain, uh, on grain, you're going to pick up more grainy flavors. And in my opinion, a little bit more complex flavors off grain, like uh, they do in Scotland is like basically like making beer and then distilling it. They use a lottering process and they separate the liquid from the grain. Um, Obviously, you need specific equipment for that, but uh, you, in general, are going to get more uh, a neutral and cleaner. Um, in my opinion, I guess not cleaner, but um, less complex uh, product. So again, depends on what you're going for. And neither of them are bad or good. Um, and then the last thing about fermentation is this phenomenon about phenolic off flavor, positive or negative. Phenolic off flavor, it sounds like a bad thing, but phenolic off flavors are generally a good thing depending on what you're making. Um, phenolic off flavor positive yeasts are capable of turning that ferulic acid into 4VG. So if we have a yeast that has this ability, then we can expect more esters and more uh, flavor and aroma compounds. If we have a phenolic off flavor negative yeast, probably should make vodka or something neutral with that. So. In general, if you talk to your yeast manufacturers, they should be able to tell you about that or their yeast per, or their yeast performance. And they should have uh, equipment to be able to kind of test this for you. But um, here at Michigan State, we have some capabilities to do the, things like this too. So if you're super curious, um, please reach out. Uh, distillation. So this is a big one. Um, you could have the same, again, same fermentation and put it in two different stills and you're going to get two different products. The technique is important. Uh, if, the, if you've heard the term low and slow, it means that during the hard cut, you want to be as essentially as low and as slow as you can. That's because you want to be able to see these cuts, right? In the beginning, you can heat it up as fast as you want because you're just heating assuming you can't, you're not going to scorch it for some way. Um, but once that vapor starts coming off, you really want to slow it off and make sure that you can really um, smell and taste, you know, the products that are coming off specifically in batch distillation. Because if you have a flow rate going so fast, and you have compounds coming out really fast, then you are likely to miss that cut and or the compounds are much more smushed together, essentially. If you were to look at distillate over time, if you're performing your distillation very fast, it's going to be concentrated in this. If you're performing your distillation really slow, it's going to be a lot longer. So you can kind of see those uh, changes a lot better. And in terms of continuous versus batch columns, continuous in general, it's going to be a constant distillate, not just in um, hopefully in flow rate, but in compounds, right? So if if you were to look at a column, we're going to get through that. We're going to go into those uh, more specifically in a second. But if you were to look at a distillate over time of a continuous column, that distillate will taste the same the whole time because the temperature is the same. And, and because of that, you're likely to get a little less flavor. In batch columns, you have a constantly changing distillate where you taste the hearts in the beginning and you taste the hearts in the middle and you taste the hearts in the end. They're all different. And that's okay. That's a good thing. Uh, that means that you're getting a lot of different various flavor and aroma compounds, um, but you have to pay a lot more attention to your cuts, right? So usually I don't see a lot of continuous uh, stills unless they're for stripping columns or at really, really large uh, facilities. Shape of the still can affect how much reflux you're getting. Um, I had one picture of this, but it was so blurry, so it, I, I didn't want to show it. Uh, but if you imagine the top of a helmet of all the different distillation columns you see in trade shows and whatnot, they all technically will offer a different amount of reflux. Reflux meaning the amount of uh, vapor that condenses and comes back down. And that in turn can uh, 
change what ends up in the distillate. Your operational parameters you have to use in distillation are your heating source. So how much heat you're supplying to the pot or to the reboiler of the continuous column. And that will eventually, will effectively affect the uh, vapor and the distillate flow rate. The other lever you have to pull is your cooling source or your reflux. So increasing the reflux will decrease the temperature in certain parts of the column and can increase the ethanol. Decreasing the reflux uh, will increase the temperature of the column and allow more water to make it through, in fact, de decreasing your ABV. Let's take a look at batch and continuous columns really sec for a second. So looking at a, a batch column, you have a pot with a reboiler. Here, I'll go over here. Pot with a reboiler and a column. As, the, as this continues, you're continuously heating this, this pot will actually increase in temperature. And so whatever uh, in the beginning, whatever comes off first would be your most volatile or the compound with the uh, lowest boiling point. And that's going to be your acetaldehyde, acetone, things that smell like nail polish remover. And once those get over, you're going to obviously put that in your head. You don't really want that. But as this pot continues to heat, you're going to vaporize more and more compounds. And yes, there's not very many. And uh, they're not likely to have a dramatic effect, they will taste different. And so if you made, you know, five different hearts receivers, they would all taste different. However, you're collecting the hearts all in one, which is you know, traditional. And then as soon as you start getting, whoops, I'm sorry. As soon as you start getting towards um, that oily, you know, um, bitter substance of your tails, uh, you're likely to put that in a third receiver. Um, so that's why the, the compounds change over time because this temperature of the pot will increasingly get hotter and volatilize more things. Higher alcohols have a higher boiling point. So that's why they come off in the tails. Looking at continuous, this is an example of uh, a continuous column with multiple feeds. So in a continuous column, you're in, theoretically, the entire column is the same temperature the entire time. Obviously, in the beginning, you have to have a heat up period and get to what we call a steady state. But the feed is fed somewhere in probably the middle or the top of the column. And the solids and the liquid, most uh, stuff that boils at a really high boiling point, will end up going towards the bottom. Somewhere in the middle, you're going to have a draw off or a little bit towards the top. That's where you're picking for your product. So if you have one spot here and this is a constant temperature, then you are taking a very, very clean, but very um, specific type of, of product. And you're not going to get whatever's in this tray and this tray above it, even if they might taste good. What's coming out the top is going to be your heads and what's coming out towards the bottom is going to be your bottoms and or your tails down here. So, you know, I like the idea of a continuous because it's very efficient and it, it does its job very well in a very consistent product. However, uh, you're not going to get a very uh, complex spirit because you only get to take off one. Now, if, if you're thinking about creating a distillation column and you're doing continuous for your finishing column, maybe have an idea to have multiple draw offs towards in the heart. So you can either pick one or you can taste them and pick. In very large operations, that's what they do. They, they are able to taste the trays and decide what tray they want to pick. Now, I would think the op uh, opportunity to grab product from three trays in this in around the same area will lend you a more flavorful product on a continuous system. So aging, uh, I was at, I think it was ACSA a year ago or something, and there was a panel talking about the terroir of aging. And I thought that was uh, really cool and it's uh, definitely believable. Um, just we're talking about how barrels in different parts of the country age differently. So again, if you took the same barrel off the same still, off the same fermentation tank, uh, and aged that in different locations of the world or even different locations of your warehouse, you're likely to get a different product coming out of that barrel. And that has to do with one, humidity. If you have a very humid environment, no matter what, water always wants to go where uh, it's 
it flow to a different concentration gradient. So if it's really concentrated in one area and wants to flow the other. So if you have a very humid atmosphere, you're going to get less water leaving the barrel. Vice versa, if you have a very dry environment, you're going to get more water, essentially more ethanol pulling out of the barrel. Temperature. Uh, hotter climates tend to have uh, faster extraction and more extraction and even different extraction because temperature is one it, variable that always affects uh, chemical reactions. And there are hundreds of chemical reactions happening in the barrel the second after you put it in. Uh, the fourth thing would be oxygen availability. So how much oxygen was in the product when you put it in. Uh, if you decide to micro oxidize your um, whiskey by you know, putting a um, carb stone in there with oxygen, you would likely see more uh, and faster uh, aging, but also slightly different. And also the permeability of the wood to oxygen. Most of us are using American uh, American oak that has variable or non-variable oxygen permeability. But once you start experimenting with other types of wood or other barrel manufacturers, you could see that the oxygen uh, flowing in or out of the barrel uh, tends to be different. There's even different types of oak out there, French, Hungarian, American, and Russian. I'm gonna to touch on what kind of those differences might be in here in a second. And then also looking at the volume to surface ratio. So if you fill the barrel halfway full, you're gonna have a different amount of alcohol compare, touching the barrel compared to not touching the barrel. Same thing with barrel size uh, or even type of wood, how you're putting the wood in. Are you putting in chips into your product? So you're not, you know, technically going by the bourbon definition, but you're making some other type of age spirit, or are you putting it directly into a barrel? And then the percent that you, this percent AVV of the whiskey or other product that you put into the barrel also is going to catalyze different reactions or push different reactions in a different direction. So the types of oak that are commonly used, uh, French oak, uh, generally, that's a slow growing tree and it has more high tannin content, more tense aroma. I hear French oak used a lot in winemaking. American white oak is a faster growth, has lower tannin content, high lactone content, which allows to have coconut, vanilla, and roasted aroma. And that's what we are most common using here in the US. But there's also Russian and Hungarian oak. Russian oak is more cedar aroma and less aggressive uh, than French oak. And then Hungarian oak has the least tannin content and more toasty. So if you're thinking about experimenting with different types of barrels, this would be what you can expect. And obviously the type of char on the barrel, um, that's one thing that you would talk to your barrel manufacturer about. They probably have a really good idea of what flavors to expect. Again, it has to do with the amount of time and the temperature of that barrel being toasted or charred. This is one of my uh, favorite depictions of barrel aging, and it just gives you an idea of all these things that can be happening. Uh, on the outside of the cask here, oxygen is allowed to come in, and this will catalyze a number of um, reactions with phenolic acids, what we talked about earlier. Um, ethanol can be uh, through acid ethanolysis or hydrolysis with lignin to, cre to create aromatic, aromatic aldehydes. We also have extraction of flavonoids and pigments to turn it yellow. We also have hydrolysis of tannins and extraction turning into phenolic acids, which can then react to other things. And then you also have hydrolysis of what we call semi uh, hemicelluloses, which are sugars. So you actually, why whiskey and all that tastes sweet is because we are breaking down some of the wood and getting these monosaccharides glucose, xylose, arabinose, other types of wood sugars. So that's all the things that can be happening. And I, I have a lecture that shows all the different types of reactions that could be happening. And there's up to 300 or 400 different reactions that could be happening, which then can then, you know, keep going. So there's just a lot that can be happening. It's kind of a black box, but knowing what you put into it, um, and knowing you know, what, what can happen in your barrel is uh, important. The last thing we're gonna talk about is uh, filtration and additions. So if you're making vodka, you're probably going through some type of carbon or charcoal filtering to uh, strip away a lot of the congeners and other aroma. 
uh, in Tennessee, you would be going through a maple charcoal filtering step. So depending on how much carbon or how you're filtering, that's going to affect the final flavor. Glycerol can be added in small amounts to alter the mouthfeel. So that, that actually can also change your perception of the product as well as the acidity. So if you change the pH using citric acid, you're also likely to change uh, the perception of that product. Caramel coloring, another one you can use to change perception. And then membrane filters, size does matter. If you are going to filter your whiskey and you're going to go through a very, very small filter, there is a chance that you're going to pull out some larger compounds. Um, I'm not saying that you're always going to change it, but there is um, worry in some industries or in some um, companies that they don't filter very, very fine because of that. But you could also, you know, leave haze. Now, when you're talking about a vodka or something, you do want to filter, you know, every last thing out possible. So, again, it depends on what you're making. So, I hope uh, I've not gone too fast and hope there's some questions out there possibly. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for joining. There's going to be a survey at the end of this session. Uh, so, please take that. And if you would like to reach me after at some point you can with my email down below. Thank you everyone.